I will now like to request uh, Mahesh Rangarajan to say a few words. Thank you, Professor Bhava. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khushu. And thank you, Mr. Ramesh. Uh, it's a, a privilege and an honor to be here today, both because uh, I did, when I think I was just out of high school, have the rather unusual privilege of getting a phone call and being asked by the Secretary of the Department of Environment to go meet him. I was then not aware of who he was. I knew he was a scientist. And I was not aware of the history of the building where he worked. The Department of Environment then was located in a place called Bikaner House. Uh, Bikaner House is one of the princely houses which was set up by uh, the ruling house of Bikaner, Ganga Singh Ji to be precise. Uh, I can now tell you that I know two things about Ganga Singh Ji which would be of interest to all of you. He was the original proponent of what is now known as the Rajasthan Canal or the Indira Gandhi Canal. And he had a very important role in the Versailles Conference where he met Clemenceau and told him that as Prime Minister of France you have a nickname, the Tiger, why don't you come down to India and shoot one? So Ganga Singh Ji was also a very great hunter. He was a shikari, very important figure if you look at those who went out after big game. The meeting was a fascinating one. We had a small environmental group. We brought out a pamphlet in the days when cyclostyling machines played the role the internet does now, not very well. And as is often the case, it was a blistering attack on the government. Uh, it was called the Scandal of the Environment Congress. It talked about the Environment Congress and why it was a very bad idea because we felt the papers were not of quality. And uh, I think for a lark, we sent it to the Secretary of the Department, the Prime Minister, and several others. What was fascinating is when the three of us went to meet him, Dr. Khushu said, you must think that I'm very angry with this. Actually, I really like it. What do you people do? What are you studying? And how did you get involved in these activities? And it's wonderful. And please write more such things, and you need to keep us on our toes. And I must say, even today, looking back, it's very unusual in this country to find people in positions of authority who are this open to young people who question the way they exercise that authority. I'm not sure we would write in quite that vein today. I think over time, you, I hope, develop a sense of humility. Uh, the issues of the environment are one of the epochal issues of our times. Uh, the environmental historian Ramachandra Guha, in a very interesting article, said that in the late 1960s, the world was in ferment. There were many issues on the agenda, social transformation, revolution, race, peace, uh, struggle for gender equality. And one of the poster children of the late 60s, which grew up, some people think it didn't grow up, was environmentalism. Now, as is often the case, social transformation, environmental awakening among different sectors of society ran ahead of scholarship. And it's only in the 80s and to some extent in the 70s, that scholarship began to catch up with it. We live at a time when it's impossible to open the newspapers or put on the television or get onto the net and not read about climate change. It's in the early 70s that uh, a team of uh, paleobiologists led by Gurdip Singh first postulated that there was a dry period which played a role in the collapse of the Harappan civilization. It was in the 70s that Elizabeth Whitcomb uh, pointed out that the great canal systems that were built in northern India not only increased agricultural production, but contributed to salinity, to waterlogging, and the spread of malaria. By the 80s, the times were ripe for change. 1982, when we went to meet Dr. Khushu, when the Department of Environment was set up, by then, things had matured. India had a series of programs and government policies and projects. But more seriously, there was a range of movements that were questioning the development policies of the time. One can't refer to all of them. But some stand out even now in memory. The agitation on Silent Valley, which talked about rainforest conservation. The issues of big dams, which were also put up by Bedti Barahi here in Karnataka. The questions of forests raised in the Himalayas by the Chipko Andolan. In Jharkhand, where there was this whole slogan of uh, Sal versus Sagwan. And I'm very struck that 1989, a very important year, it marks the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the beginning of a long period of coalition government and minority governments in India, which was to stretch, as we now know, for a quarter century. 1989 saw two very interesting books by two scholars who, interestingly, are based in Bangalore. Uh, one was uh, Sukumar's work on the Asian elephant, which looked at elephant-human conflict. And the other was Ram Guha's work, The Unquiet Woods, which looked at the prehistory 
of the Chipko movement, that peasant movements in the Himalayas, and the struggle over what the forests would mean and who would control them. In a sense, I think environmental history, and I couldn't have put it better than Professor Bhava, is really about the confluence of politics and ecology. It is like all other histories. It doesn't just seek to tell us what happened in the past. As is the case with many of us, we stray into disciplines in which very few of our older relatives or cousins or aunts or uncles are very familiar. So you would come across very strange questions like, oh, you're studying history. You must be very good with dates. Can you still recite more of them? How do you remember all those lines of kings and queens? But like all disciplines, history has evolved. It's not only about what happened. It's about why. It's not only about what happened, why, and how. It's about why we have come to this particular crossroads at this time. Were there other ways? And if we were to learn if there were other ways, other turns in the road, how can that inform us better for the present and the future? One of the questions and problems if you're a historian is that people always expect from you what they call lessons from the past. The answer, of course, is that the past can't offer lessons. It can give you insights. One of the reasons it can't offer lessons is because the situation you live in has no precedent. Look at us. We stand at the end of a century, the 20th, which saw an increase of the number of people on Earth fourfold. It saw an increase in the number of nation states on Earth fourfold. You know, the world Ganga Singh Ji was in when he went to Versailles, and now there were one fourth as many people. But as one of the consequences of the First World War and the Second World War was that many of the old empires crumbled, new nation states emerged, the old colonial systems were torn asunder. And today, the world as we know it, while it is a unified ecological whole, is divided into nearly 200 nation states. But the other great transformation, as John McNeil reminds us of the 20th century, wasn't simply about the growth of numbers or about the division of the lands, the sea, the waters, and the air between different nation states. It was simply a very major epochal transformation, such a large transformation that every one of us experiences its consequences but is unaware of its meaning, the transformation of the world global economy. So globalization is a much older process, but in the 20th century, gross world product increased 14-fold. And when you look at these changes, all three of these are being played out on a mega scale in Asia. The 21st century, unlike the 20th, the 20th was about the struggle of great countries, Germany, Britain, Russia, the United States. Many people see the 21st century as one where China and India will attain the kind of space on the world stage which they have not enjoyed for centuries. There's a very big debate which we keep ask, getting asked about. You know, when will India be like China? Or should India be like America? Now, as a student of history, it's very easy to answer this. I don't think India can be like any other country. India has to be like India. Because India has a very particular kind of history. It has a particular history in political, social, cultural terms. It also has a set of ecological legacies. Legacies which are often consequences of decisions taken long ago or recently. And none of these legacies should make us forget that we still have choices. Let me illustrate. I refer to numbers. We looked at the map of India 400 years ago. The density of population was one tenth of what it is today. It was 35 to a square kilometer. If you looked at the area that was under cultivation, it was one fourth of the land mass. Today, it's a little over half the land mass. So we've lived through epochal changes in terms of the landscape, in terms of the waterscapes. What are the consequences of this? One consequence is that when people began to transform their environments in substantial and far-reaching, sometimes irrevocable ways, they also think about it. Some people raise doubts. Some people exercise the spaces which democracy provides, not just for dissent, but for voicing opposition or for posing alternatives. To me, what is very striking about India from the time of independence, and I go back to the late 40s and early 50s, is the extent to which not only the freedom movement, but even the early years after independence, engaged with the ideas of alternative modes of development, of correctives to this major economic expansion, which was necessary, and I will argue is desirable. If you have this many people, they would want to live better lives, they would want to live longer lives. Roughly all of us are blessed with the fact that we will live, we will have a lifespan which is twice that of what Indians had at the time of independence. I'm sure there are philosophers who will say that we should also look at quality, but there are very few people who trade a shorter lifespan for themselves or their children, and rightfully so. 
But when we look at the quality of life, the issue of the environment has figured. It's not always been called that. In the late 40s, in 48 and 49, it's interesting that the government of early independent India intervened to protect the lions of the Gir forest after the Nawab of Junagadh had fled. And a year later, had a team on the spot in what turned out to be an early Harappan site in Lothar. You know, whether it was the conservation of the lions of the Gir forest or securing the remains at Lothal, they were not only engaging about a past, a natural heritage, a past in terms of a historic human heritage, they also see, saw these, quite rightly, as the cornerstone of the emergence of a new nation. So when we look at the engagements with democracy in India, we are looking not only at questions of the past, but those of the future. And here we come to a paradox. It's a very simple one. In a country where you choose to have a system where power is vested in a small group of people who cannot be turned out by a free and fair vote, it is possible to press a button and move in a direction. So if you look at the China of the 50s, I'm very struck by the enormous impact of the Great Leap Forward, which among other things led to a war on the sparrow, less well known, a war on the tiger. This is fascinating work in southwestern China of how there were uh, groups of revolutionaries, uh, uh, red, guard uh, red guard brigades, who went out into the forest and killed the tiger, which was called a striped counter-revolutionary Guomundang bandit. In India, we have had a very different history. Governments have repeatedly tried to achieve some sort of a balance between growth and protection, between the aspirations of people for a better living and the importance of keeping ecosystems intact, and between, and let's face it, competing demands for the same resource. We may all agree that we need a better India, but we rarely agree on what that better India means or how to get there. And in each of these conflicts, whether it was about dams, forests, living spaces, Tech choices of technologies for transport. There's not one, but many choices. I had a student who once wrote an essay, and it's very humbling as a teacher to say this. I won't share her name with you, but I'll just say what she said. And she had to look at an essay where there was a big dam project, a lot of people being displaced. And there was also the question of the importance of water for stabilizing agriculture in the region which would benefit. And she argued this was not a case of a right against a wrong. It was a case of right against a right. We don't have to agree with her. But I think it's important to be informed by that sense of dilemma. I began by saying historians should not be asked what are lessons, because they can't predict the future, despite what some of them claim. But I will add that one insight which emerges, or rather two, are very simple ones. The first, that the answer to whatever these dilemmas are has to lie through more and better informed debate. So one of the consequences of the debates in Silent Valley is there was a greater awareness the importance of the rainforest, and so on and so forth. But the other, which I think is equally important, and I say this as someone with associations with conservation and the environmental movement, like other distinguished predecessors who have received this prize, I don't think a student, and that's how I see myself, can claim to have helped generate solutions. Our job is to think, encourage, and stimulate other people to think. But if we were to think, as people interested in the environmental dilemma, one of the things we need to think about is to think about how to go beyond net solutions. You know, there are many figures of the 20th century who are striking, and I'll end with this. One of them was the Soviet ambassador, uh, foreign minister, Andrei Andreyevich Gromyko. And whenever he went to the UN, he was called Mr. Net. The Soviet Union, as you know, was isolated. The Western powers were very strong in the exercise of the veto power. Now, some of the cases were positive. Very few historians would today say that the exercise of the Soviet veto in the course of the 71 war was not only in India's national interest, but for the greater human good. Indian intervention helped to put an end to a genocidal regime, one of the worst in Asia. It led to the birth of a new nation, Bangladesh, which, among other things, shares with India its national animal, the tiger. Of course, they call it the Royal Bengal Tiger because of the deep Bangla nationalism the tiger is associated with. But the environmental camp, the conservation community, has to go beyond net solutions and try to think of ways that address the issues of livelihood, address the issues of democracy, while achieving conservation. This doesn't necessarily mean anyone gives up their corner. It doesn't mean that we give up what we believe in. But it does mean not only that we listen, but engage. And in the process of engagement, it seems to me that for all the forebodings of crisis which I share, this is also a historic moment of opportunity. Because economic expansion and transformation, along with political empowerment, have rarely happened on this scale anywhere. And where there is a crisis, where there are problems, there is also
an opportunity. And if the 20th century was one where the question was of human dignity and of the self-determination of countries, this one is a different century where those issues will continue to be important, material and human dignity. But you could not possibly look at them adequately if you do not take the ecological factor or dimension into consideration. Thank you very much. Good evening. We digest what Mahesh has said.